Sargon of Akkad, also known as Sargon the Great, is one of the many influential figures in ancient history. Sargon is legendary for conquering the known Mesopotamian world and establishing the Akkadian Empire. Sargon is also the father of the famous poet princess Inhuanda, which is the first poet to ever be recorded in history. The name Sargon is a biblical translation of an older Akkadian name, Sarkenu. When translated, it means true king. Sarkenu is Sargon's throne name. It is thought that he only used his throne name because he was a usurper, which is defined as to seize and hold power by force or without legal right. That is to say, Sargon is not a member of the royal line, which would explain why he would want a name worthy of a king. Sargon's real birth name is lost in history. The name Sargon was used by at least two Assyrian kings from the 1st and 2nd millennium BC in order to secure the throne by identifying with Sargon the Great. The legend of Sargon lasted for centuries. You could only imagine what he had to accomplish to have such an influence on kings 1,500 years later. So, when is Sargon of Akkad first referred to in history? It turns out the stories of Sargon the Great were lost to the modern world up until 1870 when the archaeologist Sir Henry Rawlinson published The Legend of Sargon, which he found in 1867 while excavating an ancient library from another king, Ashurbanipal, the last king of Assyria. The clay cuneiform tablet found claimed to be Sargon's biography, so this is what I will be using as a guide throughout the video. Let's start with Sargon's early life. There was not much history on young Sargon to begin with. There are also several different versions of texts known as the Legend of Sargon. The texts are typically written as narrated by Sargon himself. Depending on what version you are reading, the information is different to who Sargon's parents were. The early life of Sargon goes as followed. My mother was a changeling. My father I knew not. The brother of my father loved the hills. My home was in the highlands where the herbs grow. My mother conceived me in secret. She gave birth to me in concealment. She set me in a basket of rushes. She sealed the lid with tar. She cast me into the river, but it did not rise over me. The water carried me to Aki, the drawer of water. He lifted me out as he dipped his jar into the river. He took me as his son. He raised me. He made me his gardener. So what can we take away from the text? Well, the text claims that Sargon's mother was a changeling. It is possible that this is a mistranslation. Some other translations list Sargon's mother as lowly, but most historians now think that she was a high priestess. The idea of her being a changeling could have been linked to the Temple of Enanna, where the followers were usually depicted as hermaphrodites. This theory makes more sense, as there was a ban on a high priestess giving birth, so the description of lowly could have meant she fell from grace. Sargon's mother did care for Sargon, as she sealed the reed basket, allowing him to float safely, until he was found by an irrigation worker named Aki. Interesting enough, the name Aki means to draw forth. Young Sargon was adopted by Aki. Adoption is not uncommon, as adopted sons could benefit a family business. Sargon was eventually appointed as a gardener, but of course, this is not Sargon's destiny, as the goddess Inanna would fall in love with him. With her support, Sargon would seek out a greater path. The next three texts give us an idea of the prior events leading up to Sargon taking the throne of Kish, thus controlling Mesopotamia. Two of the texts are from the Old Babylonian period, from 2000 to 1500 BC. The tablets were discovered in what is left of the cities of Uruk and Nippur. The tablets are usually combined together into one translation. Sargon and ur -Zababa. The third text is from a similar time frame and was found among the ruins of Babylon. This text is missing a lot of information, but it still adds to the legend. The narrative starts with describing the setting before any mention of Sargon. The city of Kish was usually linked with kingship over all Sumer, the land of the Sumerians. In the past, the kingdom of Kish was in decline, but now it has regained its influence once again. According to the king list, a bizarre ancient text, its records show that the city of Mari on the upper Euphrates had lost its influence to the city of Kish. The ruler of Kish, Kugbo, according to the king list, was the only woman listed as a ruler. She earned the description, who made firm the foundations of Kish. Eventually, Kish would lose her domination over Mesopotamia. Kugbo is said to have ruled for around a hundred years. Her son Pusr-Sin was said to have ruled for 25 years, and his son Urzababa 
was said to rule for up to 400 years. According to the king list, the reign of Ursababa was remembered as being successful and approved by the gods. Interesting fact, the name Zababa was the name of the local city's god of war. The name Ursababa can be translated to the voice of the god Zababa. Now we move our focus back to Sargon as he enters the court of the king Ursababa. Sargon's original profession is known to be a gardener, but an ancient account tells us that he is given the task of regular deliveries to the palace. Soon after, Sargon was promoted to receiving deliveries from the king. This may have possibly given Sargon residence within the palace itself. On one night, King Ursababa had a dream, which convinced him to promote Sargon to cupbearer. In ancient times, the duties of a cupbearer were not explained in Sumerian inscriptions, but luckily for us, they are described in Assyria not too long after the Sumerians. In Assyria, the cupbearer was only second to the king. Sargon had the king's trust, but there was a limit to that trust. Lugal Zajizi of Uma began his military campaign to control Mesopotamia, just so everyone is on the same page. Just like ancient Greece, with the many city-states that fought for territory, the same could be applied to the cities of Mesopotamia. Lugazajizi of Uma marched his army through Sumer. He was, of course, successful in conquering the city-states, one at a time. Lugazajizi would be the first Sumerian king to have a successful conquest to this level. Lugazajizi was also the last Sumerian king before the rise of Akkad. It was said that Lugazajizi would leave the city of Kish alone, but after the conquering of the city of Rook, Lugazajizi changed his mind and saw the opportunity to move on Kish. You can see why Ursababa would be in a panic after learning of the army that was approaching his city. Ursababa, for some reason unknown, became suspicious of Sargon. But what is clear is Ursababa decided to send Sargon to Lugazajizi with an offering of peace. Sargon had with him a message to give to Lugazajizi. We are not sure if the message contained any form of peace agreement, but what is sure is the message asked Lugazajizi to kill Sargon. Again, for reasons unknown to us, Lugazajizi refused to do so, and funny enough, presented Sargon the chance to join him. Sargon accepted, and together they marched on Kish and conquered the city with ease. Urzababa escaped and went into hiding. For what happens next is not very clear, as the text is very fragmented, but for whatever reason, Sargon and Lugazajizi became enemies. Who knows, maybe Sargon had an affair with Lugazajizi's wife, or maybe Sargon was sent on a mission to conquer a region and took all the credit for himself. That does make sense, as you will see later in this video. Sargon and his army marched on Uruk and took it over. Lugazajizi marched his army from Kish to meet Sargon in battle which ended badly for Lugazajizi and his army, as they were defeated. Sargon put Lugazajizi in chains and brought him to the city of Nippur, where the god Anil was sacred, and who was also Lugazajizi's protector. This was an act of humiliation, as the defeated king was forced to march through Anil's gate. Sargon chose the goddess Inanna for his divine protector, and since Urzababa and Lugazajizi were out of the picture, Sargon could declare himself king and take control of the region of Sumer. When Sargon defeated Lugazajizi and took over an already united kingdom, he could then use this increase in military power to create the first empire to rule all of Mesopotamia. One thing that may have helped Sargon out was in the Sumerian cities, the lower class were getting tired of upper class elites taking much of the land and leaving the lower class alienated. Since Sargon was said to be a common gardener in his early life, he may have appealed to the working class. But just after Sargon's rise to power, the city-states and the ruling elites were not willing to accept Sargon freely. They fought against their new king and allowed Sargon to prove himself by conquering them. Sargon organized campaigns against the city powers in Sumer, taking over the cities of Uma, Ur, and Lagesh. Sargon was not satisfied with just the simple surrendering of the defeated cities. He also destroyed the walls of the major city-states of Sumer to put an end to their resistance. After conquering all of Sumer, Sargon either builds a city of his own or restores an older city. This city is known as Akkad, located somewhere on the banks of the Euphrates River. In the past, a king would conquer others for the glory of his own city as well as to collect their resources. But Sargon, on the other hand, broke this tradition. He conquered for no one, only for himself, for his enjoyment. But this only pleased Sargon for a while, until he prepared for another campaign. Sargon sought to build an empire that expanded beyond the reaches of Mesopotamia. One tablet about Sargon reads, Sargon, the king of Kish, 
triumphed in thirty-four battles. Sargon crossed the Tigris and took a lamb from the Elamites. By taking a lamb, he was taking control of several important trade routes and valuable resources that came from the Taurus Mountains. Sargon made a treaty with Ilba in central Syria, where they had to recognize Sargon as their ruler. Sargon then took over the Ammonis Mountains of Lebanon, as they were the main source of cedar in the whole Near East. He even made his way into the land of another Semitic tribe called the Amorites, which were more nomadic than his own people. As he made his way up the Tigris River, he conquered the little northern city of Ashur, and after that, he moved farther up north to take the small city of Nineveh. Sargon then continued to battle his way northward, all the way up to the city of Mari, where it too was seized, probably because Sargon and the Akkadians didn't want to be opposed. Sargon is even thought to have invaded Anatolia and possibly visited the island of Cyprus. There are even claims of Sargon traveling the Mediterranean Sea, as well as sending ships as far as India for a source of trade. Sargon proved to be a great conqueror, but how did he keep the great empire he built in working order? Sargon maintained his empire by placing his most trusted men in positions of power set up in the city-states. A later Babylonian text calls these men the citizens of Akkad. They were made up of governors and administrators that were seated in over 65 cities. One of Sargon's inscriptions reads, from the sea above to the sea below, the sons of Akkad held the chiefdoms of his cities. Now, the Sumerians can be seen as foreigners in their own cities. As when Sargon took a city, that city became Akkadian, along with Akkadian officials and troops. Sargon also strategically placed his daughter and he wanted as a high priestess of Unanna at the city of Ur. Through his daughter, he could take control of political, cultural, and religious matters without moving a finger. Inhuanda was a literary genius, but she may have also been a powerful administrator as well. Through Sargon's leadership, he kept his empire stable, which led to the construction of roads, upgraded irrigation, greater influence in trade, as well as progressing the arts and sciences. Sargon created a tax system that was fair for all social classes. He was also involved in many building projects, such as repairing Babylon, and apparently according to some sources, it is said that he founded it in the first place. But that theory is not proven. Sargon established a full-time army. As far as we know, it was at least in the city of Akkad. An inscription reads, 5,400 soldiers ate bread daily with the king. I highly doubt this was a daily event. Maybe more likely a yearly occurrence. But if not, it still would have boosted the morale of the troops and kept them well fed. This was a great advancement over the armies of the past. Sargon improved the lives of many living in Mesopotamia. But even though all the accomplishments people still resisted the Akkadian rule. Sargon continued to come across uprisings as city-states became more independent and clashed with the Akkadian Empire. Of course, the uprisings are understandable as the Akkadians did take over Sumer. This is supposedly Sargon's own words. In my old age of 55, all the lands revolted against me and they besieged me in Agad, but the old lions still had teeth and claws. I went forth to battle and defeated them. I knocked them over and destroyed their vast army. Now any king who wants to call himself my equal, wherever I went, let him go. According to the Sumerian king list, Sargon reigned for 56 years and died in old age of natural causes. Now you can imagine that all the battles he fought, you never would have thought he would die from natural causes. Maybe this contributed to his legendary status. After Sargon passed away, the kingship was passed to his son Ramesh, who had to stop the uprisings in order to prove he deserved to be king. Ramesh died nine years later, and the kingship was passed to Manish Tusu, who reigned for 15 years. Both of Sargon's sons were good rulers, but it was Sargon's grandson, Naram Sin, that grew the empire past what Sargon was able to achieve. Naram Sin ruled for 36 years, and when he died, supposedly of natural causes, he was succeeded by his own son, Sharkali Shari. Just like all the rulers before, he too had to try and stop the continuous revolts. But unlike the Akkadian kings before him, he did not seem to have the ability to maintain order and failed to stop the city-states that formed their own independent kingdoms. Not only that, but Shao Kali Shari was also at war with the Elamites, the Amorites, and the invading Gushans while trying to keep the Akkadian Empire in one piece. But eventually it was too much to handle and it all caved in on itself. The Gushans were attributed to the fall of the Akkadian Empire and the Mesopotamian Dark Age, as later Mesopotamian writers wrote about the Gushans as being the cause of the collapse. But new research proposes that the collapse was likely the work of climate change, which created a famine, making the empire vulnerable to invasions and uprisings. 
I am of the opinion that Shar Kali Shari was not a terrible king. I think he was screwed either way. Some good things must come to an end, and a ruling above others in their own lands was only going to last so long. Over time, the history was forgotten, leaving the legends of Sargon the Great, who created the first multinational empire. Here is my question to you guys. Is Sargon the Great a dictator? He did take over other people's territory, making them foreigners in their own land, but he also accomplished many great things to give back to society. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. If you guys liked the video, make sure to leave a like and share this video. If you haven't already, subscribe for more history content and I'll see you guys in the next video.